So welcome everybody. We are looking at season two, episode four today, the perfect opportunity. And as uh, my mom mentioned in the chat, there's a lot going on. So let's start with prayer. Today is actually the Feast of St. Dominic in addition to being a Sunday. And so we didn't celebrate Dominic's feast day at mass, but I think it's a perfect day to talk about the chosen on this feast of St. Dominic because St. Dominic was very devoted to the mystery of the incarnation. Um, that's one of the reasons we attribute the rosary to St. Dominic, the development of the rosary, was because Mary told Dominic to go preach the incarnation. He was preaching against the heresy that denied that matter was good. Um, so the Albigensians thought that matter was evil and they taught that matter was evil. And so Dominic, by going out to preach the incarnation, he was preaching that matter is good, that the created world is good. And so I think it's very fitting on St. Dominic's feast day to talk about the chosen when the chosen is really a beautiful story about the incarnation, whether that's a scandalous mystery to us, as we looked at in the last episode, or whether it's something we just need to be reminded of more often, that beautiful mystery that the word became flesh and pitched his tent, literally John 1, 14, that I'll reference later in this episode, that um, he pitched his tent, he dwelt among us, and that's important. So on this feast of St. Dominic, let's remember um, him, his witness, and ask for his intercession. Let's pray to um, our most holy trinity together as we pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. St. Dominic, preacher of the Incarnation, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. One thing I wanted to kind of talk about um, that I, I should have talked about, I mean, I talked about it in the last episode, but as I was praying through this Bible verse, it came to me even more clearly. And so I, I wanted to kind of make an allusion to it. This is a reference from last episode when um, Matthew, and we'll hear the verse again, but um, in the in the coming episodes, but when Philip teaches Matthew that, that line from the Psalms, we looked at it, um, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed deep in the depths, you are there. And we'll see, again, we'll have it referenced again in the season. But as I was praying with it, this morning or yesterday, um, I realized that's also such a beautiful testament to the incarnation, reference to the incarnation, um, that the Lord did make his bed in the depths, deep in the depths. Why? Because he humbled himself to take on our humanity. He went to the deepest place. He went to the depths for us. Um, you know, in the Eastern Church, they talk more about the harrowing of hell than we do, but that he actually went to the abode of the dead to release the souls, right? He fought Satan, um, Obviously, he was going to win. That was not a fair fight. But he fought Satan even dying for us, right? And so he went to the depths for us, but he also ascends to heaven for us. And he, what does he do when he ascends to heaven? But he takes our humanity to heaven. And so he really brings our humanity into heaven, which is a crazy mystery that we often kind of gloss over. We talk about the Paschal mystery being the death and resurrection of Jesus, but we have to say it's the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus because the mystery of the incarnation is that our humanity goes to heaven and takes its place um, in the person of Christ to the, at the hand, right hand of the Father. So um, I was meditating on that Psalm 139 again and realizing I should have mentioned that the last episode, but it didn't come to me then. Um, and so I wanted to mention it here that I think that Psalm 139 that Philip teaches Matthew is a reference as well to the incarnation. Okay, so let's jump into season two, episode four, A Perfect Opportunity. And so we have the very famous story from John 5 of the healing at the pool of Bethesda. Um, and there's a lot in this episode. I want to actually take a little bit of time just to kind of recap it uh, just briefly because there were some, a lot of different characters that we had never met before that we were getting introduced to. And so um, we'll talk a little bit about what actually happened in the episode. And then I want to talk about the Zealots, the Feast of Booths, and the Pool of Bethesda. And then we'll be out on this beautiful Sunday afternoon in time for um, Nashvillians to watch the Grand Prix. So... The first 10 minutes I, I referenced in the question at the beginning on YouTube, but the first 10 minutes were very different, right? There was no dialogue. Dallas, if you watch Dallas's interviews be, um, after the episodes, he talks about this artistic choice. Um, the shooting was more artistic. It was a little more grainy. 
And of course, there was no dialogue. There was just kind of this unfolding of the story. And he admits that they were um, inspired by Up. And so if you've seen the Pixar movie Up, those first moments of the film really catch you unaware. They unpack very, very quickly and really pull at your heart very, very quickly the story of this married couple. And so they were inspired by that. And so um, they really, in, in some way, they wanted to have kind of a microwaved character development, I would say. How do we tell the story of this man at the Pool of Bethesda and get you to immediately um, be part of this character, like be part of his story, but in a very quick time, okay? So, um, Kay, I agree. Like, it's always interesting with the backstories. Like, where is this going to lead? Who is this? And I wondered, and if, if you want to respond in the comments, I wondered how many people guessed who his brother was. So we have Je who they've named Jesse, who becomes the invalid um, at the Pool of Bethesda. And we see Jesse grow up, right, alongside his brother. And um, did anybody guess who his brother was during this vignette? I'd be interested. Um, did you realize who we were being introduced to? Um, soon after the introduction, we hear his name um, when he's at Zealot training camp. Um, and so you probably guessed who it was by then, but maybe not, right? And so I would just be interested, throw in the chat, did you guess who his brother was before you heard his name um, in the show? But so that was the intro, right? Um, very dramatic, very artistic, really trying to set everything up faster than they could have any other way. Um, like it's a microwaved uh, character development. Um, you know, it was very different for The Chosen. Um, you know, I think 10 minute, a 10 minute long introduction is gutsy. I know a lot of people loved it and I think it was a great way. I don't know how else they would have kind of set up this character in any other way. I personally thought it was a little bit long. Um, I, I don't know how else they would have set up the character development. I think I just would have liked it a little shorter, a little more compact. Um, but I thought it was it was beautiful and I thought it was a great way to do what they needed to do. Okay, so um, so I have people responding. So some people said, my mom said she didn't know until they mentioned his name. Um, I guess I'm always suspicious and I'm always on the lookout for the other apostles. So this season has really been me trying to figure out when do we get the other apostles. Um, and so I think I guessed it. Um, Jackie says she didn't notice the long intro, so that's good. Um, that means that I'm more quickly uh, distracted and bored than you are, which is a great thing, um, that you have more of a dungeon span than I do. Um, so yeah, I like to hear your, your feedback and your, so throw it in the chat. So just to kind of recap the episode, so basically we have Simon the Zealot, um, he has left during the intro, we saw him leaving to go train with the zealots. Um, the intro showed us that Jesse had been injured. They tried all these ways to, to cure him. They tried all these right ways to get him to walk again. Um, and so then Simon, after witnessing a brutality against, um, you know, by the Roman soldiers, he flees and he goes and joins the zealots. Why? Because he thinks he is going to join um, in the prophecy, really, of Zephaniah. Zephaniah's prophecy is really big in this episode. We, we hear Zephaniah's prophecy again and again and again in this episode. So um, that's going to be key for us. Um, and so he interprets Zephaniah differently. Um, we'll talk about that. He interprets Zephaniah and he goes to join the zealots. Um, so he's been tasked with um, killing a Roman magistrate on the streets of Jerusalem. Um, so the Zealots were a party or a historical sect of, 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 they were really a political sect of Judaism, um, also known as Sakari, Sakari, for the daggers they wore under their cloaks. Um, that was the, their other name. And so the fact that he has this dagger under his cloak, that's very historically accurate. Um, Judas the Galilean was probably one of the most famous zealots. We actually have him referenced in Acts of the Apostles by Gamaliel when um, Gamaliel says, you know, we recently had the incident with Judas the Galilean. So he was a zealot. Judas is, um, Gal Judas the Galilean, not Judas the Apostle. Um, Judas's grandson, possibly um, his son, led the revolt then, um, was a leader in the Jewish revolt in 66, which eventually would lead to the fall of Jerusalem in 70. Um, so the, the zealots were a, a party um, that thought that they needed to overthrow um, militarily the Romans. Um, so we see Simon training with the zealots 
and then he's given this task of over of killing a Roman magistrate. So that throughout the episode, we see how he's going to do this, how he's going to um, stage this um, distraction, and then end up killing the Roman magistrate. We're also introduced to Atticus. Now, Atticus is that spy guy that for some reason reminded me of Russell Crowe. Um, and so Russell Crowe decides he's going, you know, he's spying. Um, and so when Simon enters the city, presumably he, set, presumably he says he's entering for the feast, and we'll talk about that in a second. He um, says that he has family near the Antonine Fortress. Um, and so Atticus overhears this, realizes he wouldn't have had family there, and so immediately begins to follow him. Okay, so Atticus knows this is going to happen, and throughout the episode we see them planning this, and then also Atticus planning how he's going to kill Simon himself, because he's going to set up um, a ruse where he is actually in the place of the Roman magistrate. So he meets with Petronius, who looks like he's straight out of some, like, Roman movie, right? I was like, are we like on the set of like Ben Hur, um, and so or Gladiator, and so Petronius, who actually is, um, he's an Osmond, which I thought was adorable. Um, Dallas mentions that in an interview. He's a, a Donnie and Marie Osmond's nephew, which makes sense because they're filming all of this in Utah with the Mormons. But um, so Petronius, he organized. So anyway, Atticus eventually stands in the place right when they're walking to dinner. And he's going to kill Simon himself. And we know how that ends. And we'll talk about that at the end of the episode. So that's kind of the arc of Simon um, there, that whole plot. It could get a little confusing because who the heck's Atticus and who's Petronius. But there, in a nutshell, that is what happened with the Simon. Um, that's the Simon plot. And this is Atticus. And we are going to see Atticus again. He's not going away. Um, so we're going to see Atticus again, at least in this season. Dallas hinted that we might see him in the future as well. Um, I want to refer. I want to remind you, Zephaniah three. That's going to be the huge verse of this episode. You hear it again and again and again. And so when Simon gets his task and he's walking past the zealots who are training, they are they are um, they are proclaiming, they are praying, um, Zephaniah three sixteen. Later, Simon goes to the temple, and what does he hear read out loud? Zephaniah three nineteen. Um, this is also the verse, as we'll see, that Simon um, references when he writes to his brother. So Zephaniah 3, um, all about the healing of the lame, um, which is obviously going to be very, it's a messianic prophecy, and it's going to play a big role in um, both Simon and Jesse's kind of conversion to the Messiah. Okay, is everybody with me so far? I hope so. So I want to talk about the zealots. We just talked about the zealots. Um Shmuel is back. I can't say his name nearly. You know who says it the best is the actor that plays Nicodemus. I love the way he says Shmuel. Um, so Shmuel is back with his friend Yanni. And um, this is all setting up for the future. So we're going to see them a lot in coming episodes. Um, I don't know whether Pharisees would have preached on the street like Shmuel did. Um, to me, that just didn't ring right. And I don't have any. I actually researched. I looked into it. Um, we don't really know that much about the Pharisees. Much of what we know um, comes from Josephus and the New Testament. Both of those sources, especially Josephus, um, they're not exactly unbiased. So um, we don't actually know that much about the Pharisees other than that they, their main name means separated. Um, they wanted to make sure that, you know, that they were very faithful to the law. They focused more on synagogue worship so they're not priests, okay, and that's important. They would not be priests of the temple. So they really focus on synagogue worship. And if you think about it, after 70 AD, you know, there's lots of different sects of, of Judaism. Um, we had the Zealots. Obviously, after 70 AD, the Zealots disappear. We have the Essenes. Now, that's a whole amazing other group that we could talk about. The Essenes disappear. Um, I believe they all converted to Christianity. Um, and then we have the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Really, after the fall of Jerusalem, all we have left are the Pharisees. Why? Because all we have left are, is synagogue. We don't have a temple. Um, and so, anyway, so ju that's just to say we don't really know that much about the Pharisees. And I talked about this in season one. I think we have to be careful not to um, interpret the Pharisees incorrectly and to see them as these bad guys. Because if we do that, 
we risk misunderstanding what Jesus, like the shock of Jesus's criticism. The Pharisees were well respected. They were also very well loved by the people. Um, they actually had a more lenient interpretation of the law than like the Essenes. Um, the people loved the Pharisees. And I think sometimes we have, again, we talked about this in season one, but we have this idea of who the Pharisees were based on, I, I had a friend who one time said like, when the Pharisees come on the scene in the gospels, we have like the Imperial March from Star Wars in our head, like here come the bad guys. And that does us a disservice, both with understanding what Jesus was doing, but also our Jewish relations. Um, and so I just want to be careful with that. So I don't know whether the Pharisees would have been preaching on a street corner. I, it just doesn't seem to ring correct to me, but I haven't, I haven't been able to find um, a definitive answer on that. Um, okay, so now we have the feast. So I want to talk about the zealots, the feast, and the pool. Okay, so my three things. We're on the second thing, the pool, or sorry, the booths. Um, so we have here, Dallas has interpreted John 5. So that's our ver that's our gospel for this episode. Um, jo Dallas has interpreted that the feast referenced in John 5 is the feast of booths. Um, some interpret, so it doesn't say in the gospel. It just says that they're at the, in Jerusalem for a feast. So there would have been many feasts. Um, one interpreter, um, one scholar said it might have been the Feast of Purim, which we find in the Book of Esther. That's unlikely. It, it's more likely that it would have been one of the pilgrimage feasts that they would have gone to Jerusalem for. And there were three pilgrimage feasts. There's the Feast of Booths, which is what Dallas is presenting here. There's a Feast of Passover, and there's the Feast of Pentecost. Um, Passover, we're going to see in John 6. We're actually going to see booths in John 7. So it's interesting. Um, the scholarly research I read, many scholars believe John 5 would have actually been Pentecost, but there were several that said they believe it was booths. So we don't know. It's not named in John. But um, the pilgrimage festivals, those three festivals, all Jewish men over um, after, you know, age of 12 or 13, after becoming an adult, would have to make the pilgrimage to Rome. Um, women and children could also come. And so we see this spoken about. Um, we see the apostles really talking about it and teaching Matthew and Mary about the Feast of Booths. Now, would Matthew and Mary really be that ignorant about the feast? People have asked Alice about that. And I think this is an important point. Probably not. They probably would have known. They wouldn't have been as ignorant um, as they're depicted. But, and I think this is a great point for Dallas, and this is what we have to keep in mind for this season, and probably the coming seasons, is that Dallas is using Matthew and Mary to be our eyes and ears, to ask the questions of the viewers that we would have. I mean, many people watching The Chosen would have no idea about Sukkot, right? They would have no idea about the Feast of Booths. And so what he's doing through Matthew and Mary is allowing the show to teach without being didactic. He's allowing the show to, um, Matthew is going to ask questions that we have <laughs> because we don't want the show to be a lecture, right? We don't want the show to be a documentary. Um, how do you give this info without the show being a catechetical lesson? How do you give the show without the, the how do you give this info without the, the show just being a reading of the gospel, right? We, Dallas has the very difficult task of unpacking these things in a way that's um, evocative, that's entertaining. Um, he needs to flesh out this inner, this understanding without it just being a reading of the gospel um, and so or a reading of Leviticus. And so that's the way he's going to use Matthew and Mary. So sometimes we might think, you know what? Matthew would have known this. Why is he asking this? Or in the coming episodes, and I'm going to be honest with it, I don't like the way they've portrayed some things. The way they've had to portray them, though, is to move the story forward in a way that it doesn't just become a reading of the gospel, um, that it is still entertaining. And I, I think we need to give them that because this is a TV show <laughs> and we need to remember that. He needs to present these events in ways that are entertaining to watch. OK, so the Feast of Booths. 
um, is the the feast. We find it in Leviticus 23. Leviticus um, has all the, the three pilgrimage feasts and how they're they're celebrated. And this is the last one that's presented in, in Leviticus 23. It was um, a feast that the harvest was over. So it was a celebration of the harvest, of the gathering of the crops, and a celebration that the Lord had given them even more than they need, right? It's a nice reference to the wedding feast at Cana, right? Or the multiplication of the loaves. So the Lord has given them even more than they need, and they celebrate um, harvest season being over. They would build tents or booths to remind themselves of the time where they were dwelt in booths in the wilderness. So it was a reminder of the time they spent in the wilderness and the way God provided for them in the wilderness. Um, and so we still have the Jewish people celebrating this feast today. Um, I'm going to try to drag this picture, and I don't know whether it's going to work, but we're going to try. Let's see if this works. Did this work? No. Oh, yeah. Okay. So here we have, hopefully you can see that. Here we have, um, this is a modern day booth that was um, built um, outside. This one is actually outside the place where the upper room is on Mount Zion, and also the tomb, the, the tomb of David. It's not really the tomb of David, but it's it's celebrated to be the tomb of David. That's in a whole other episode, um, podcast. Um, but so that is, I was at, I was actually in Jerusalem in 2019 during Sukkot, during the Feast of, of Booths. And so there is a picture of a modern day booth that somebody built. Um, I think I have another one. These were built outside, um, the Western wall of the temple. Um, and so you see, so this is right. Th these booths would be facing actually, um, the Western Wall, where the Jews go to pray. Um, and so you can see there that those are some modern booths that are built. Okay, I'm glad that worked. Hopefully that worked. You're all like, I didn't see any pictures. Um, so they still celebrate this today, and they, would, they wouldn't necessarily, they don't necessarily dwell in the booths today, but they might eat in the booths. They might go outside and, and dine in the booths. There'd be restaurants that would build these, and so you could go out and you could dine um, in the booths. Okay, so we have this beautiful booth built by, by Nathaniel, our architect, and um, as they're eating there with Jesus, I think it's so beautiful to remember that Jesus is the fulfillment of all these Jewish feasts, including the festival of Sukkot, including the Feast of Booths. Why? Because Jesus pitches his tent. That's literally John 1 14. The word pitched his tent. He dwelt among us. Um, and so it's a it's a beautiful reminder to us that that Jesus actually fulfills every single prophecy in a different way, right? Um, we might not understand how he fulfills them. They didn't necessarily understand how he fills, fulfills them, but Jesus is always fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies. The word of God pitched his tent. He dwelt among us. Um, so my mom asked a great question. At the Transfiguration, Peter offers to build three booths. Was it at the time of the feast? So it's interesting. It was not, most scholars say, it was not at the time of the feast. Um, I believe, and I didn't look this up ahead of time, so I could be wrong about this, full disclosure. I believe it was actually closer to Yom Kippur, which would have been shortly before the Feast of Booths, um, but it was not. And there's actually an article I read one time about how Peter is so taken up that he's celebrating the wrong feast. Um, he's so in awe of what's happening is he wants to celebrate the wrong feast. He's out of time. Um, but I don't actually remember where I read that and I don't remember what feast it would have been near. Um, I need to go back and read my accounts um, of where it falls in all the gospels. So, um, but it is a reference. I mean, I think that's why Peter says, let's build some booths. He wants to stay with the Lord in the wilderness, and um, we know he can't, right? He has to go down from Cal he has to go down from Tabor so he can climb Calvary. So, um, James, Big James asks Jesus about Zechariah 14. James is, apparently loves Zechariah 14 because this is the same verse that they quoted in the last episode, where they want to, you know go fight for the Lord and the Lord's going to fight, right? Zechariah 14, we have it again here. And um, this verse does re does mention the Feast of Tabernacles, which is really interesting. Um, it is exactly what Big James says, right? That the, all the nations will come and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And some people have asked later, like, why the Feast of Tabernacles? Like, of all the feasts, why does Zechariah pick the Feast of Tabernacles to reference? And um, some biblical exegetes say perhaps it's a reference to the gathering of the harvest 
of the Lord, that we're all being gathered, that we are the harvest being gathered together. We don't know. But um, I think it's just interesting, like that whole discussion, like the booths won't mean anything to their enemies. Like why would their enemies celebrate the Feast of Booths? And Jesus has that beautiful line. I think one of one of the most beautiful lines in this episode, um, everyone has wandered through the wilderness at some point. Um, I think he's slowly reminding them, you know, you've had it hard and the chosen people have had it hard, but everybody has had it hard. And so you all don't get the monopoly on suffering. <laughs> um, everybody has suffered in various ways. And I think that's a good reminder for us. It's this whole discussion about prophecy is also a good reminder that the prophecy will be fulfilled in a way um, that maybe they don't expect. So every prophecy is going to be fulfilled, but just in different ways. And so they want to see Zechariah fulfilled very literally, right? They want to go to battle. They think the Messiah is going to take them to battle. And, um, Every prophecy is going to be fulfilled, but not in a way they expect. And that really leads into Simon and Jesse and this exchange that they have. Because they've both interpreted scripture, but sometimes our interpretation of scripture falls short. And that's a good reminder, right? So um, will, will the prophecy be what everyone expects? No. And um, Wendy refers, it's a great knowing look between Jesus and Mary. Um, and then when Mary references her own situation, I thought that was really sweet. Um, so the pool of Bethesda. So as we, as we finish up, um, oh, I do want to say like Simon seeing the crucifixion, I think was really powerful. It's a reminder to Simon, like, are you ready to be crucified for this cause? Right? So Simon's walking past the crucifixions and he says, you know, why were they crucified for murder? He is facing, you know, and, and then as he stands on the, on the, um, roof and looks out, he's facing what's going, you know, to possibly be his fate if he murders this Roman magistrate. Of course, it also is the fate of those who follow Jesus, right? And so Simon's looking at this, this crucifixion, um, and there's there's different ideas of how Simon was martyred. Um, he was possibly sawed in half, um, but many of the apostles would meet that fate of crucifixion, not because they were martyred, but because they were haters of the human race. Again, that's a whole nother um, um, episode to talk about, you know, the early Roman persecutions of the church. But I thought it was interesting that Simon's looking out to the crucifixion, assuming this is going to be his fate if he does, if he carries out um, the, the murder of the Roman magistrate. But he's also looking at the, his fate if he follows Christ. He just doesn't know the Messiah yet. And then I think that moving scene of Jesus walking past the crucifixion. Um, what did you think of that? Like I thought, um, so often we don't think about the fact that Jesus would be very familiar with crucifixions. He would have seen crucifixions, knowing that that was going to be, um, you know, that was the, the will of the Father and that he was going to do that for us. Um, I thought that was a very moving scene. So um, interested in your thoughts as well. Um, okay, so the Pool of Bethesda. Now, this is also something I've done um, a, de a decent amount of research on because I was kind of baffled by the um, history of it because it was so, the way they depicted it was quite different than what I have been familiar with. So um, the way they're depicting it, the Pool of Bethesda, as being um, a pagan pool. And part of this comes from the fact that there was a Roman temple built on the spot. Um, Asclepius, who is the god of healing, you might be familiar with, um, his symbol is the um, snake. And Asclepius, we have the wrong symbol for the medical profession in the United States. We actually have the Staff of Hermes, but we thought it was the Staff of Asclepius. So the Staff of Asclepius is supposed to be the sign of medical profession because it's a sign of healing. The Romans built a temple of Asclepius at the Pool of Bethesda. Now, we don't exactly know when, but most scholars say 2nd century AD. The way it's presented here in The Chosen is that it was built prior to Christ, perhaps in the second or first century BC. Um, and so the way they're presenting it kind of in the chosen is that it's a pagan place. That's why Simon's reluctant to go there. Um, you know, Dallas was asked like, if it's a pagan place, why are the Pharisees hanging around? He said he sees the Pharisees in the scene as kind of like the beat cops who are tracking down people who are not obeying the law. Again, I don't think this is a good interpretation of who the Pharisees were. I don't think the Pharisees would have done that. There is indication, of course, that the Pharisees were spying on Jesus later, um, trying to catch him, but I just don't think that's a, I don't, I don't agree with that interpretation at this point. I don't think they were beat cops looking for people breaking the law. 
I just don't think that's who they were. Um, but so it, so this pool has kind of a complicated history, partly because we actually didn't know where it was until the end of the last century. So you have scholars reading the Gospel of John saying that John had made this site up. Um, now, part of this is biblical interpretation of the 18th and 19th century wants to discredit John. They want John to not be John because they, for John to not be John is a big deal because John repeatedly says in his gospel that he's an eyewitness. And we talked about this in the first episode. Um, it's a big deal that John is John. And so for us, if we want to discredit the gospel, we need to discredit that John is John. Now, if that sounds confusing to you, that's great. That means you're a good, holy read reader of scripture who just wants to believe that John is John. And I, that's wonderful. And I love you. Um, but there are people out there who really want to discredit the gospel writer, John. And you'll have priests say things, crazy things like the gospel attributed to St. John. I've heard that preached at mass before. Um, and that's ridiculous. So John is John. John was eyewitness to these things. He says he's eyewitness to these things. Dallas has the great little Easter egg of John actually writing it down, if you notice that, as he's witnessing it, because this is only found in John's gospel. So scripture scholars want to discredit John. They want to say that John is fanciful. They want to say that John made all this stuff up. Um, well, the joke was on them when we actually did find the Pool of Bethesda at the end of the 19th century. And they've continued to do excavations. So they've only recently even found this Roman temple. Um, they're continuing to do excavations. You can go to the site today. It's near the Sheep Gate, which we always knew the Sheep Gate existed. Um, and it, it's exactly the way John described, the five porticos. So part of the confusion, I think, of this episode of what the Pool of Bethesda was and my disagreement with what they depicted it as is because there's also a lot of disagreement about what the Pool of Bethesda was and when all this came about. Um, so some, um, so again, they discovered it in 1956 and they're still doing excavations there today. There has always been a history of healing with this pool, always. Um, I believe that it was a Roman mikvah, or I'm sorry, a Jewish mikvah. So mikvahs we've talked about before. Um, I talk about them extensively in my Bible study, Encountering Christ. Um, if you're not familiar with the Bible study, Encountering Christ, shoot me a message. You can find my contact information below. Um, mikvahs were Jewish ritual purification baths that had to have living or flowing water. Um, again, I believe Jesus is the fulfillment of the mikvah. But I believe, and Peter actually says when they come upon the pool, Peter's like, oh, it's a giant mikvah. Um, I think it really was a giant mikvah because it was near the temple. And um, if the water moved, it was because mikvahs had to be living water. They had to be moving water. And there's, they found some um, a system that showed where they would open one of the pools to flow into the other pool, and that would cause a stirring of water. Um, so the other kind of tricky thing about this is the idea of the angel stirring the waters. Now, for those of us who maybe read the New American Bible, the Revised Standard Bible, the English Standard Version, which is the New Augustan Bible, um, I believe the New Jerusalem Bible. So those of us who read those translations of Scripture, usually the, ca the Catholic accepted translations of Scripture, will not find John 5, 4 in your Bible. And that's really important to this story. You will not find the verse John 5, 4 in your Bibles because it was found during the translation process much later that somebody had just added that verse in, that a, 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 a copywriter or a copyist, I should say, added this verse referencing this kind of Jewish superstition that an angel stirred the waters. They just put it in there. And later translators realized this is not the words of John. Like they used words that John never used anywhere else in any of his writings. It just wasn't John and I. And so they, they went back to original texts, including the Vulgate, and that verse is not in there. I believe the only Catholic translation you will find John 5, 4 in is the Dewey Reams. Um, the Dewey Reams has retained it. Everywhere else, you'll skip that verse and there will often be an asterisk. And at the bottom, at the footnote, it'll say this verse has been omitted because it's not um, reliable. It wasn't in the original text. So Dallas references this in his discussion after the episode. And um, to his credit, because not every, I believe not every Bible Protestant would have this approach. I really believe that. And I, I give cre credit to Dallas for having this approach. He says, you know, what if the Bible didn't actually say John 5, 4? So for those who read the King James verse, the King James Bible, the verse would be there. 
And so I give Dallas a lot of credit for saying, you know what, scholars say, and the, this isn't like a willy-nilly scholar, this is like all great biblical scholars, um, like good biblical scholars, <laughs> they say this verse isn't authentic. And so Dallas said, we, we're not going to, we're going to interpret it, that it didn't exist, and um, that that, that, by, that verse is not John. And I give him a lot of credit for that. Um, so, so that's one of the reasons it's kind of referenced because I think he did that out of respect to those viewers who would be used to seeing that verse, but it's not really given any credence because it probably was a Jewish superstition. So um, the other thing I want to point out that give Dallas a lot of credit for approaching is that Jesse and Simon kind of get in a scripture verse battle. Did you notice that? So. Jesse goes to, or sorry, Simon goes to visit Jesse. Um, he has not visited him in years and years because it's a pagan place. Again, I don't believe it was a pagan place, but that's the interpretation that Dallas is choosing, which is fine. Um, and so he hasn't gone to visit Jesse. And so they kind of get in this battle of, um, you know, of scripture. And they both want to use scripture to prove their point. And Dallas pointed out, you know, we both often, like people have scripture to back up their points. The verses sound like they oppose each other, but it's not. It's that he says, these are his words, I believe that sometimes we're just taking one verse too far or take them out of context. Again, I give him a lot of credit for that because we, we do need valid biblical interpretation. We can't get into Bible verse wars because um, we, we need to understand that verses can seem to oppose each other if they're taken out of context or if we take one verse too far. And so I really gave him a lot of credit for pointing that out. Again, Simon references Zephaniah 319. And what I love about this is that Simon has misinterpreted that prophecy, right? In a sense, not completely, but in a sense, right? He's had a misinterpretation of this prophecy that now he has to go to battle for the, you know, and that the Messiah will, will lead him in battle. But his sign that the Messiah will come is that the lame will be, will walk. And I love the way Jesus uses this, right? He uses this to speak to Simon's heart because this is something Simon believes and Jesus is going to use this, not compromising the true meaning of the prophecy, but yes, that these miracles are a sign of the Messiah, right? That's what he says to John the Baptist followers too, right? Go tell John that the, the lame walk and the blind see. That is a sign of the Messiah. Why? Because the Messiah will make these miracles happen. He will create these miracles as a sign of the even greater miracle that he comes to give us, right? So it's not just about physical healing, it's about spiritual healing, but the physical healings are always remit, are always foreshadowing, are always pointing to, are always hinting, are always driving at the spiritual healing, okay? Um, so then we have the beautiful scene of Jesus coming to Jesse, right? He's, he's there to meet Jesse, and it's straight from scripture that he looks for the person, um, you know, they say, why him? And he said, he's been here the longest, in John, it says, Jesus saw him and knew he had been lying there a long time. So that's straight from scripture. And he goes and he asks him, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? There's a lot to meditate on John, on John 5, because of the way he asks that question. And I love the way that Dallas interpreted it. You know, Dallas says, like, has his, in, his infirmity become his identity? Has his infirmity become his security blanket that he holds on to? Um, I love this. Dallas says, the thing that is causing us pain is actually the thing we're really clinging to because it has become our identity. I don't know about you, but I know people where that's, they don't really want to be healed because it has become their identity. Because that's what they feel has given them something, right? To either, it's interesting, is it given them something to live for? Has it given something, it's given them their identity and they don't know what life would be like healed. And so out of fear, they hold on to that infirmity. And that's why Christ asks him because he's not gonna heal Jesse if Jesse doesn't wanna be healed. We have to desire healing. We have to open ourselves up to healing. And so it's a good reminder for us to look at what wounds am I holding on? What wounds do I actually not want to be healed of because it is, it's given me my identity? And am I courageous enough to release those wounds to the Lord and to ask to be healed and to want to be healed? Um, you know, I have a friend who really does not like this guy um, in the scriptures, this schmuck, 
because, I mean, I'm not saying this about Jesse, but in the scriptures, it just seems like he's laying there. He's making all these excuses. Really, you've been there for 38 years or 25 in this because they, they say that, you know, he's been infirmed for 38 years. But he's been stuck there. He's been lying there. And all he has is excuses, right? Like, oh, I can't get up. And, oh, no one will help me. Um, and actually, in Scripture, if you read the Scriptures, it's terrible because then, like, the Pharisees are like, who who cured you? And he's like, I don't know. And then he finds Jesus. And he's like, this guy. And Jesus is like, hey, hey, be cool. Like, just don't sin anymore and go do your thing. And he's like, this guy, this guy healed me. And you're like, come on, man. So I liked Jesse better than the guy that I've always pictured in John 5. Um but um, but I think it is a really good, beautiful understanding of um, healing and wanting to be healed. And are we holding on? And that I love the way Dallas interpreted that. Do and I love how how beautifully excited Jesse is um, after he's healed. Right? Um, it's my first time. Right? Like he's he's just it's it's beautiful. He's a grown man who has never walked since he was a small boy. And I think the actor did such a beautiful job portraying that. Um, you know, did. Did Jesus do it to provoke the Pharisees? I don't know. Um, Dallas is portraying it that way, you know, and that's fine. Um, I'm not convinced. I have some some reservations that um, Jesus is just doing it to kind of stir things up. But, um, you know, he does tell him to carry his pallet. Why did he do that? It was the Sabbath, and that's what the Pharisees are going to latch on to. Now, that's not in the law. That's in the written rabbinic tradition. So, um, so yeah, I mean, and it does say very clearly in John 5 that this is what led them to seek his death, both because he violated the Sabbath and then in John, when they question him, he um, speaks of God as his father. Therefore, you know, giving himself divinity. Um, and so then they sought even more to, to, to um, put him to death. It's interesting. Augustine says what the Arians failed to see, the Jews saw, that to be the son of God meant you were God. And um, so that's definitely what Dallas is portraying as we end this episode, that Jesus did this particularly to provoke the Pharisees. Um, but I think the most beautiful part is Jesse carrying his mat and being that sign for Simon that the Messiah has come. And now Simon, you know, he doesn't obviously kill the Roman magistrate. Um, was I the only one that when he dropped his basket thought that he was carrying tennis balls? Maybe it was just me, but I think he was carrying pears or something, but they looked like tennis balls. Um, and then obviously Simon sees that and we have that beautiful scene where he realizes the Messiah has come because Zephaniah 3 has been has been fulfilled. So at least to a certain extent. But so that's all we have. Um, just before we close, if you have any questions, comments, thoughts, throw them in the chat. Um, before we close, if you could do me a huge favor and give me a thumbs up. I know this is one of those cheesy things that they ask for in YouTube videos, but it really does make a big difference in the algorithm. And so if you can subscribe to the channel, if you haven't subscribed yet, if you could please give me a thumbs up, just click the thumbs up. Um, things like that really help the, the YouTube algorithm and help others find this. You know, there's a lot of people that, um, that have talked about The Chosen and want to know more about The Chosen, and it's really hard to get up on the YouTube Chosen videos because there's so many videos that The Chosen have put out, which is great, that it's really difficult when you search The Chosen to kind of get up in those YouTube research results. So if you could tell a friend about the YouTube discussions, if you could give me that thumbs up, if you're watching or even after, like if you're not watching live, it's just as important to give me that thumbs up and then um, subscribe. So I know those are all cheesy things that influencers ask you to do, but um, I need you to do that. So thank you for doing it. Um, before we, as we wrap up, yes, absolutely, mom. I think um, mom says it almost seemed that Jesus chose that time to st also stop Simon's assassination attempt. So I think it is, it, it's all connected, right? So maybe it wasn't, it, Dallas is portraying it that it, you know, was supposed to stir up the waters. But I do really think that he, it, it's leading to the call of Simon, right? So he's putting everything in place for that next apostle. Um, is this going to be the 11th? 
right? We have everybody but Judas, right? Simon the 11th? That sounds right to me. Thank you all for joining us. We will be um, back on Thursday evening to discuss episode five. So episode five, I actually forget the name of it. I didn't write it down, but we will be back to talk about episode five on Thursday evening. So tell your friends, spread the word. And again, if you can't watch these live, they're archived on my YouTube channel. And if you know somebody who would rather listen rather than watch, I also upload them the day after to Apple Podcasts and Spotify. So you can find Joan's take on The Chosen over there as well. So, okay, thank you all. God bless. Good night. Have a good Sunday.